Hello, everyone, and good afternoon, good evening, good morning. I don't know. I'm sure there are people from all around, so I don't want to discriminate time-wise. Fun to see a couple faces and, and names that I recognize here. Um, we will wait just a few more minutes to let a couple more people trickle in before we kick off, but we won't wait very long. We had a a wonderful turnout of, of a wonderful response to this webinar. So I'm excited to see it myself and have all of you be a part of it. Um, in the meantime, while we wait, maybe uh, for those of you who wanna chat in the chat box where you're joining from, uh, anyone who hasn't participated in much stuff with UPS may not know, but one of the fun things about a UPS webinar or program is that you tend to have people from all around the world. Uh, so if you wanna, I am joining from Bogota, Colombia. Bogota, Maria Luis, Lucia, genial. That's great. Nice to, nice to have you with us. We got Silicon Valley, Canada, two Canadians. All right. Um, yes. All right. Well, um, I will. We'll do one, one minute before we get going. <clears throat> okay, maybe we'll let the next couple join. And as they do, um, I just want to start by welcoming you all. Welcoming you all. Uh, my name is Julia Delafield. For any of you who don't know me, I'm the Director of the Center for Executive Education at the University for Peace. Uh, the University for Peace is a pretty neat and unique institution in this world. We're located in Costa Rica and we were established by the General Assembly of the United Nations way back in 1980. So we're an extremely international university whose true aim is to help capacitate, I'm thinking of it in Spanish, help uh, train the next generation of leaders to be peace builders. And we do this by thinking that if you can get people ready to be change makers in their own environment, following their own passions, then you have a whole army of people out there ready to go. Anybody who's not muted, if you could mute, it'd be great too. There we go. Um, so we offer transformational educational programs uh, that allow this to happen with a, a diploma in global, global leadership and a diploma in social innovation as the two kind of capstone programs. And today we're really excited to have with us Dr. Theoria Kaysen. We've known Theoria for many years now. Uh, she originally joined us in the diploma in social innovation program and came to Costa Rica for one of her courses within that program. And we developed a relationship with her over the years, last year in 20, no, this year in earlier 2022, she was here with us at the University for Peace and gave a presentation, a, a, was a speaker at our Gross Global Happiness Summit. Uh, so that was a really wonderful way to get exposed to what she does as well. Um, and we're lucky to have her today here talking to us about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, I won't go in depth into her uh, background because I know most of you have probably seen her bio, but Theoria has uh, a vast wealth of knowledge in this area. She's worked in the corporate field on DEI issues. She teaches through Cornell around this topic, and she has her own uh, organization venture that she launched that's working on these issues as well, Theoria and Praxis. So uh, with that, Theoria, I would love to hand it over to you and let you um, jump into what where you have to share for the next 45 minutes or an hour. All right. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Um, first, I want to make sure that you all can hear me clearly. So if I can get some head nods or thumbs up just to make sure that my volume is coming through, that would be great. Thank you so much, Corinna, Jessica. I see that. Awesome. Um, and then my next ask is that if you are willing and able, please turn your cameras on so that I can see your faces um, so that I know who I'm speaking to uh, for the next 45 minutes to an hour. Thank you. Um, no pressure. It's just a simple request. Um, I am going to start to share my screen so that you all can see my presentation. Let's see here. 
can you all see my presentation? Give me a thumbs up so that I know you all fantastic. All right, so I'm just gonna dive into the beginning portions of the material. Julia um, gave you a, um, an overview of my, um, of the slides advancing, um, an, an overview of my experiences, but um, just in case you all are not aware, um, my name is Gloria Kaysen, that's how I prefer to be called, um, and I am committed to this work. So that is the, the short end of the stick. I do it professionally, I do it in my free time, I do it in my sleep because I'm passionate about it, and I hope that that translates um, as we continue on in our presentation today. So the first thing I'd like to clarify are some of our goals for our time together. Um, three simple objectives. One of the things I want you all to leave with is an understanding that equal practices do not account for systemic disparities that disenfranchise employees who may hold marginalized identities. Um, and I'll, I'll elaborate on that claim a little further. Um, the next thing I want you to do is to learn how organizations can address the problem of inequity in the workplace. And I hope you all achieve that objective um, by absorbing the five steps that I've identified um, that any organization can implement in order to work towards a more equitable, equitable and inclusive workplace environment. So does anyone have any questions about the objectives I've identified before I move forward? All right, so my first question before we delve into the material, um, give me a, just a quick thumbs up uh, using the reactions on the screen or you can hold your physical hand up if you've participated in a session like this in the past. A few thumbs up, sorta, of, kinda, maybe. All right, okay, I just wanna see, and there's some faces that I recognize pictures, happy to see you all here. All right, so we all may have varying levels of comfort and knowledge when it comes to this content. Um, I want to impress upon you the importance of engaging separate and apart from where you entered this discussion. You all have valuable perspectives that will add to the discourse. And so I would like to hear from you. That means I am thanking you in advance for your participation in the chat. I'm thanking you in, in advance for coming off mute when I ask you all to respond to questions um, because your experiences matter. And I, and I want to make sure that we create space um, for you to share um, and engage so that there's an exchange. All right, so my first question for you and your first opportunity um, to respond in written form um, is, to, resp is to, to answer the question, what is equity? In your own opinion, your own definition. So, Please read these definitions and listen to me, um, or excuse me, instructions and listen to me clearly. I just want you to write your definition in the chat. Do not click send um, because what I want to give everyone the opportunity to do is to craft um, and scribe your own individual definition of equity. So I'll give you about five to 10 seconds to write that. And then when I click go, you can submit your response in the chat and we're just gonna flood the chat with everyone's responses and then I'll give you a moment to go back and reflect. Um, so I'm gonna start my timer now and I'll give you about 10 seconds to write your definition of equity in the chat. All right, it's been about 10 seconds. So go ahead and press send and just flood the chat. Thank you all for participating. I also wanna let you know that I have two monitors. So if you see me looking off to the left, um, it's because I'm looking at uh, the screen to see what you all have written. All right. All right, so appreciating and providing what individuals of varied identities and experiences need to succeed. Equity is providing resources where needed. Yes, opportunity for people from different backgrounds providing equal opportunity to all parties involved as well as individualized support. Thank you, Bianca, for that caveat. Each person has what they need in the moment to be successful, absolutely. Equal ability of access to resources and general situation of fairness. Yes, adjusting opportunities for everyone to have an equal start. Thank you all for your engagement. I really appreciate that. It's good to level set so that we have uh, 
clear understanding of um, where people are coming from when we are talking about um, terms. Um, one of the things that I want to leave you all with um, is an image and a very succinct claim. So equity describes the just and fair allocation of the resources according to need. And a lot of people very clearly made that delineation in the chat. It's a matter of giving people the resources that they need. Um, and to make it very plain, the image on the left side of your screen shows what happens when we give everybody the same thing. Um, and it demonstrates that when we give everyone the same thing, um, it doesn't necessarily achieve the goal of giving one, giving everyone access to the experience or the opportunity, giving everyone access to thrive in their given capacity. Equity means we assess each individual, and Bianca um, uh, offered that caveat, we assess each individual and we give individualized support such that every, everyone then has equal access and opportunity to thrive within a given workplace environment. And so equity should always be the standard. Oftentimes we will hear people use the term equality and equity interchangeably, um, but if we make equity the standard, then we provide equal access to opportunities for success. All right, so in preparation for this presentation, um, I did uh, a little bit of research and went way back to a report that was written in, in 2006. Um, and it was reflecting on um, equity and development around the globe. Um, and so this report in, in short defines equity and two basic principles. So it's the avoidance of deprivation and outcomes, um, meaning that no one is deprived of having those basic needs to thrive. Um, and then also it defines equity as a person's achievements um, should be determined by their talents and efforts. Um, and it should not be limited to matters of their identity or circumstances beyond their control. Um, and so, it's really important to make that distinction when we're talking about um, cultivating an environment that is inclusive and equitable, that there are systems and barriers that exist oftentimes um, which target people's um, identities or target their circumstances beyond their control. And we're not making assessments based on their achievements, talents, or efforts. Another thing that's particularly important to note from this presentation um, is that uh, it, the conclusion within the report is that uh, inequity of opportunity within a nation and between nations sustains extreme deprivation. It can result in a waste of human potential um, and then often weakens prospects for overall prosperity and economic growth. Um, and economic equity is, is truly a leveling platform for freedom. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on in the presentation as well. All right. And so here, I give you an opportunity to read this quote to yourself. Audre Lorde is one of my favorite. If I could get one person to come off mute and exercise your voice by reading it aloud, that would be fantastic. If you're raising your hand, I can't see you. So you can just come off mute and speak. There is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not leave, we do not live single issue lives, either Lord. Thank you, Denisha. Uh, what are your thoughts on this quote? Uh, that, you know, this is an everybody um, issue and not just an issue for certain groups or uh, individuals uh, because we live in it, we live in communities, so um, we should support each other as such. Thank you very much. And then I saw Jessica raised your hand. Um, so what are your thoughts on the quote? It's an everybody issue all the time. Mm, help me, help me understand what you mean by all the time. We can't just pick and choose when there are struggles. They're always around us. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that's a really important thing to note, uh, particularly when we're talking about advocacy and allyship um, and selecting for struggles that um, resonate most with us by and inadvertently ignoring those that may not directly um, impact our communities on the day to day. You have a comment. Please go ahead and share your thoughts. Hi, hello. Um, I think when I read it, I thought about you know, um, equity here in our country where they say, okay, we will provide um, better opportunities. So we're gonna raise the, the salary of women. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, no, it's not just raising the pay, it's other things that are included within that. Or, okay, we're gonna support, um, and you mentioned the ally community, we're gonna, we're the LGBTQ community, we're gonna support um you know um lesbians and it's like no there is an entire it's not a single mm -hmm. person or individual there's an entire community behind that so it's not a single issue that you have to attend it's a greater macro issue thank you bianca and and for clarity um please tell us where you're logging in from you said in your country but i i missed what country ah, dominican republic Oh, fantastic. Thank you. The Caribbean. Uh -huh. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and then I want to illuminate Abigail's thoughts. So two things that come to mind: intersectionality. Absolutely. Um, and one is not free until all are free. Thank you, Abigail. Um, I often remember a quote and I, I don't remember um, who said it, um, but it essentially said, you know, if my community is ill, but I'm well, I, I can't consider myself well. Um, because I live in community to the point that Dr. McCall made. Um, and so it's a matter of assessing um, our individual needs, but then also um, considering um, where there are opportunities um, to give back or to support or to advocate or ally alongside of others um, who may be having struggles that don't impact our individual lives, but do impact our shared lived experiences. Yes, we are all interdependent, thank you. Um, all right, so we're gonna move on. I'm really loving y'all's engagement, so I appreciate that. The one fundamental truth that I want to leave you all with, um, it, like where you find humans, you will always find inequity. Um, it will happen without intentionality because as individuals we are inclined to lean towards our survival instincts and to prioritize things that matter to us most, um, to prioritize the safety and resources for the people who matter to us most. Um, and that doesn't matter where we're located on the globe. It's just those individual inclinations, it's those tribal in inclinations, it's the, the instinctive function that we have to survive However, over time, um, humans and the lifestyles that we've come to create for ourselves have created a whole lot of cushion and comfort such that the priority for the need to survive is not perhaps as um, um, imperative as, as it used to be. Um, and so we could create, because we have the margin um, to be more generous, to be more intentional, to be more inclusive, but we default to simply prioritizing the things that are most important to us because that's the easiest thing to do. And we'll talk about our responsibilities to each other and community and um, ways to achieve that a little later in the presentation. All right, so another thing I'd like to illuminate from this report um, is that you know, equity in and of itself is intrinsically important as a developmental goal, both within nations and between nations. Um, and greater equity can lead to a fuller, more efficient use of any nation's resources. Um, the report essentially looked at a number of countries around the globe. And generally speaking, as human beings, we have a preference for fairness in theory. Um, the thing and the reason I offer that caveat is because often folks don't necessarily want to give up something in order to create a more fair and equitable experience for someone else. Um, but if you ask people at face value if they have a preference for fairness, the answer is yes. 
Um, I would argue, however, and this is one thing I've been leaning towards, is that in order to achieve like parity um, and, and equitable environments, we all have an individual responsibility to infuse a set of peace into our own individual piece of the world. So I'll say that again. We have a responsibility to infuse peace, P-E-A-C-E, into our own P-I-E-C-E of the world. And so there are a number of people who are located around the globe. And so I want you to begin to think about what is your responsibility to infuse peace and equity into your physical space of the world, so the piece of geography where you reside, the communities that you live in, whether they're professional or personal, the humans with whom you interact on a daily basis. What are you intentionally doing to infuse peace and to advocate for peace and to advocate for a more equitable experience, um, given that Diane has uh, reminded us that we are all in interdependent in this earth that we share. And so now I want to segue our conversation um, into situating the context of our preference for equity and our preference for fairness into the workplace because workplace is a piece, P-I-E-C, where most of us, if not all of us on this call, operate on, on a regular day-to-day -day basis, multiple days out of the week, if not you know, the majority of the days in a seven-day period of time. And so I want you to begin to think about if you have a preference for fairness and you desire equity in the workplace, um, how are you engaging to achieve that goal within the context of your place of practice? All right. So generally speaking, most leaders feel most comfortable with the concept of equality um, because people tend to be um, conflict averse. Um, they don't like to have difficult conversations. And so they say, if I just treat everybody the same, if I just give everybody the same resources, then I've done my job as a manager. I've done my job as a people leader. Um, the, the added responsibility is really, truly taking an individualized approach at the people in, the, in your environments, whether you are the formal leader or the influential leader and saying, mm, maybe I should evaluate you know, the resources that I'm offering this person. If a person is um, demonstrating an opportunity for growth or development, maybe I should be having you know, some additional conversations with this person giving them supplemental resources such that they can grow and develop in the role. Um, and I will reiterate something that was stated previously, equal practices do not account for systemic disparities that disenfranchise marginalized employees. Um, so if there are people who hold identities that are in the minority within the workplace environment, I'm, I'm impressing upon you the importance of being very intentional of engaging with those individuals and creating space for them to communicate what they need so that they can be supported. Or if you are a person who holds such a marginalized identity, figuring out how you can articulate um, what it is that you need to the people who are the decision makers so you can engage in the empowerment of advocating for yourself and communicating those needs um, and then holding them accountable and responsible for doing so. Um, and so with that in mind, I want you to reflect on your current place of practice, um, give you a moment to think about policies, practices, unspoken rules in the workplace that are just part of the organizational culture. When you hire a new person, there's just a way of operating, a way of being, styles of communication that aren't written down and in, in any onboarding process. There aren't, they, they may not be included in the presentation on the first day of work, but people are just supposed to like pick it up and know how to go with the flow. Um, reflect on what some of those policies and principles and practices might be. And then I want you to answer the question, how might these structures create or sustain a culture of inequity in your place of practice? So I'll give you about 30 seconds to reflect on that. And then I would like to invite you to write your comments in the chat, but I would also like to hear from two or three people so that we can engage in a dialogue, All right? Lack of affirmative action programs. Thank you, Abigail. Okay, who else would like to, all right. Marciano entitlement from individuals and lack of ownership. 
stands in the way of creating equity in the workplace without shared, it is an uphill battle. Vision, without shared vision, it is an uphill battle. All right, so I'm going to ask a few of you to come off mute and elaborate either on comments that you wrote in the chat or people who did not write but would like to speak. Let me give you a moment to engage in that way. I can speak. Yes. Um, so I just, uh, hiring practices are very, very important just because they do have the opportunity for disparities to occur um, because we're not living in an equal world, unfortunately, right? So without, without those, um, meaningful affirmative action programs, which are specific to people who have experienced repression, then it, the status quo kind of can take, um, can move forward. And that, that would be of, you know, white supremacy and, and uh, colonial kind of structures. So it, it really is important in my eyes to have that representation from the get-go. And then afterwards, you know, um, inclusion of those employees so that it's not, it's not a terrible place for them to work, you know? So it, it really is every step of the way from hiring um, and to day-to-day -day operations that there needs to be more equity infused um, programs specific to employees who've experienced marginalization. Thank you so much. I didn't see who spoke, so I can't call you by name, but I appreciate your engagement. Um, and you illuminated some really important um, barriers to equity in the workplace. So a culture of supremacy, lack of representation, um, um, and then just casual hiring practices that are not intentional and thoughtful from start to finish that often create barri barriers for people to even have access to the organization and certainly can serve as barriers to feeling included once people have been hired. Um, so thank you so much. That's one of the, my takeaways from what you shared. Um, who else would like to come off mute and share your opinion? And I'm gonna catch up on the comments in the chat. I think I, uh, oh, can you hear me? Yes. I never, okay, I never tested the mic. Um, yeah, I would like to like, uh, actually to piggyback off of that. That is actually kind of where I hinted that in my comment. Uh, there are some other factors always coming into play. Maybe uh, people in the workplace are not uh, feeling like they're part of a collective with a joint vision and a joint mission. Mm -hmm. And even if they are at a certain point, personal entitlement comes into play when it comes from uh, I have that degree, I have that position, and they will look down on another person who probably didn't have the resource, maybe didn't have the resources, or just not the natural talent to learn more, but they are still part of the team, part of a collective, part of an organism within the work structure to get a goal. And that's not looked upon because people's own ambitions and personal achievements, they feel that uh, that is more important or supersedes the collective. And that's why they probably don't uh, feel that the others are as deserved of some of the uh, uh, things that they like, uh, the preferences that they get, and the same thing counts for lack of ownership, not knowing what your role is to actually cause inequity, and that people are not capable of looking themselves in the mirror. And that is what I mean. It's very challenging for a uh, uh, for a leader, for a manager, for a director to coach an entire team towards that because you're actually asking something from that. Uh, from them personally, and I guess the, the previous commenter actually uh, stated that like the, the, the hiring processes need to actually already be inclusive when it comes to that. You need to know what it is that you are going to create there as a workspace, as a culture, and not just look at the credentials and the resumes, uh, because otherwise this becomes uh, really an uphill battle. Thank you so much, um, and that was very eloquently stated. Um, and an uh, excellent supplement to the, the previous comment that we heard. And I agree with you wholeheartedly. There's certainly um, individuals within a workplace that may have a bias or preference in favor of folks who have their shared credentials or experience. Um, and, and oftentimes um, we have been conditioned in professional environments to rely very heavily on arbitrary qualifications to weed people in or, or um, 
um, to weed them out of being considered for opportunities within the workplace. Um, years of experience, a person must have 10 years of experience in the role. You get a fantastic applicant and they have eight and a half years and you say, nope, they haven't paid their dues and you don't consider them. Um, or many of the other things that you've already shared, so I won't revisit, but I think those are excellent points to consider um, and will lend themselves to our discussion when we talk about the five steps. I also want to give voice to a couple uh, comments in the chat, um, one from Shakima, who's not able to come off mute, um, but people often expect that everyone has the same access to prior knowledge and resources. So they put the onus of individuals to advocate for themselves. And you are completely correct, Shakima. There's a whole lot of assumption about um, the, 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 those um, unspoken rules that I was referencing, the presumption that people know what to ask for, that people know to whom they should make those requests. Um, and so when, there's, when those assumptions linger within an environment, many, many times um, people who would be able to meet a goal or who would be a, a great fit for a position or an opportunity miss those opportunities um, because they simply just don't know where the resources are and they, they don't know who the people are that can best support them. One of the things that I've learned throughout my career is that there is not a lot of intentionality devoted to an onboarding process um, to help people not only know what it is that they need to thrive within an organization, but also like who the people are that will continually serve as a resource, as their champions, as their sponsors, who are the people who will share with them the unspoken um, ways of being within an organization so that folks can quickly acclimate into a culture if it is in fact in their best interest to acclimate into that culture. Sometimes it might be in the individual's best interest to question and interrupt the culture um, because um, things need to be um, remixed a little bit. And let me see this final comment from Carla. Um, students evaluations are used with that. Yes, um, I have a number of um, faculty friends who have talked about the disparity in the evaluation process for faculty. Um, particularly for my friends who are women in the academy and women of color. Um, and yes, there, there um, is not a lot of um, uh, consideration for the ways that students may disproportionately critique their female um, or women identifying faculty members in the academy. And it's, it's, um, I don't know that there's anything currently being done in the academy to remedy that. Um, so thank you for adding that to the conversation, Paula. Is it, I heard someone else speak when I talked about interrupting culture. Did someone have something to say? If not, feel free to come off mute later in the presentation, but I'll move forward. All right, so I want to offer an example that uh, Bianca illuminated earlier just as a way to um, provide uh, a demonstration for the ways that inequity impact women around the globe. Um, and so this is very recent research um, to suggest that women continue to experience um, gender wage gaps worldwide. And to Bianca's point, no, it is not simply just giving um, people an increase in um, salary. Um, we also um, want to consider their comprehensive experiences in the workplace. So not only are they having more money, are they getting developmental opportunities? Are they being considered for pipelines for promotion when it comes to succession planning? If succession planning happens within an organization, um, how are the high potentials being evaluated and identified? Um, so this is just one example that I wanted to illuminate. A number of other ways that people don't experience equity is not so much in tangible ways like compensation, but just experience. So if you think about the experiences of people on the LGBTQ plus IA um, community, like there, there is certainly a preference and bias for folks who identify as heterosexual. They can talk about their partners, they can talk about their intimate or romantic interests, their lifestyle without um, 
fear or a consequence of retribution or judgment or harm, people in the LGBTQ plus IA community may not work in an environment where they have the luxury to bring their full self and share that um, aspect of their lived personal experiences in the workplace. Um, when we talk about um, people um, who, who come from certain um, social economic backgrounds, um, I remember often, so I'm a first generation college student um, and the level of um, access to resources that I currently have is not the level of resources that was um, accessible to me when I was a child in the home just by virtue of the um, economic structure that I was born into. And so that certainly impacts um, the um, access to resources that I am in line to inherit, for example. And so I've, I've sat at the table with people who talk about their second homes and their boats and the properties that they own and the cars that they have. Um, and to the point that Marci Mar 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 Marciano was making earlier, like we're all in the same place at the same time in the moment, but when you listen to the conversations of some of the people who are my professional peers from an economic perspective, we were not in the same place at the same time. Um, so I just want to offer the number of ways that inequity can pop up in a workplace environment. Um, and I see your comment, Vera, the onboarding process is crucial. Yes, sharing of information and pairing new hires with members um, can, can make or break a person's trajectory within an organization. All right, so let's move on in the interest of time. Um, so let's talk about the cost of inequity. So I'm gonna run through some fast facts here. So according to the True Office Learning, inequity has had a significant impact on employee engagement that ultimately impacts retention. So these, these stats um, are particularly related to research that um, um, took place for the USA context of workplace and culture, um, but the trends are consistent across the globe. Um, generally speaking, when people do not believe that they're in an environment that's equitable, when people do not have access to a sense of inclusion, they're three times as likely to disengage from the work, three times as likely to leave the workplace environment in a year, um, and 2.6 times as likely to withhold ideas, which ultimately impacts innovation and subsequently um, is taking away from the uh, whole community that is work within, within a workplace environment. And in theory, you people are hired because we want them to add their best ideas and we want them to bring their innovative energy such that the organization can collectively work together to achieve those goals. But in the absence of equity, um, people um, hold back and reserve and eventually leave. And that costs not only the organization and not only costs the team, but it costs the individual because most people don't join a job or join a team and think, man, this is probably gonna suck. I'm gonna look for another job within a year, right? So there's an expense to every um, individual or group when you consider the cost of inequity in that context. Um, again, specifically some US-based stats, um, but in 2021, the Society of Human Resources and Management, that's what that acronym stands for, said that the cost of absenteeism to businesses specifically related to racial inequity cost businesses $54.1 billion. So that's a critical mass of income and revenue that was not realized simply because the racial and ethnic environments within the workplace were not equitable. All right, so um, the only way to achieve parity, and this is my, my claim, a true equality between groups is to intentionally lead with equitable practices. And so I'm referring back to our individual responsibility to infuse that peace and equity in, that, in our piece of the world. All right, so let's get into these five steps that I promised y'all. So these five steps to achieve equity within your organization include number one, um, assess your organization. So really sit down and reflect on the demographic composition of the organization where there is diversity, not only comprehensively within the workforce, but at all levels of hierarchy within the workforce, within the workforce who has access to making decisions. Um, is the culture of the organization very top down where the people who are the leaders 
make decisions and offer direction? Or are there opportunities for consensus um, building? Do uh, people who hold marginalized identities have the opportunity to express their experiences or the gaps in their experience without fear of retribution? Some of the ways to collect this data and preserve people's um, uh, um, right to share without fear of retribution is to survey your population. Um, you can do engagement surveys that are specifically focused on matters related to inclusion, sense of belonging. Um, I know in some countries you cannot do demographic surveying of the population, which is fine. You can ask experiential questions um, that point to whether or not people um, feel they have a sense of belonging, feel included. You can certainly, um, organizations can certainly do um, compensation audits to see um, how the distribution of resources pans out across uh, varying populations within an organization. So the first thing that I'm offering is that you need to like, assess the organization in very tangible and pragmatic ways, um, but also assess the culture. So if you're being an intentional and inclusive leader, you're looking at the things that aren't spoken in the workplace as well. Who isn't participating in conversations uh, where folks share information about their personal life? Just uh, to name a few. Right, the next thing I will offer, center the needs of the marginalized. Um, and so Kimberly Crenshaw is the author of the theory of intersectionality. Um, and it's something that I read from her. She made the argument that if you really focus on the people who hold the most marginalized identities within your organization and you figure out a way to make them whole and you figure out a way to make sure that they have all of the things that they need, you will be able to think most broadly about what humans might need within the workplace in order to have access to equity so that they can then have equal opportunities to thrive within their workplace. And so that requires, a lot, again, a lot of intentionality from the leaders, one, and also some humility to say, what am I missing? What are the gaps in my lens? And who can I give a seat to at this table who may have a different point of view or a different perspective so that they can, can offer me a, 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 an alternative perspective. They can offer me a different point of view because invariably we all have five blind spots as human beings. And so if we accept that fundamental truth that we have blind spots, that we have biases that cause us to lean towards or create preferential environments. Because again, I say where you have humans, you have inequity. If you accept that as a fundamental truth and you invite more people into the discourse, it will help you identify the gaps in your approach, identify the gaps um, where you may unintentionally be omitting resources or excluding people, and then give them the opportunity to communicate with you what it is that they need. Um, yes, thank you, Stacy. Um, and then my next uh, recommendation is develop a strategy. So there are plenty of organizations that have a strategic plan for the goals they want to accomplish in the next two, five, or three years. Um, and they will offer um, finite, like measurable goals, key performance indicators. Very often when it comes to DEI, folks offer these like lofty statements, these um, feel good aspirational paragraphs that say we're on this journey towards, um, you know, a more inclusive environment. But rarely do you hear organizations say we're on a journey towards profitability, right? Um, folks identify the goals that they want to accomplish within a quarter or within a semester, um, and they, they offer measurable ways to ensure that they're working towards those goals. And so I'm arguing, arguing that when it comes to equity in particular, um, and again, making sure that folks have everything that they need, we need to be specific and we need to identify a strategy. And that can include, but may not be limited to the compensation audit that I, that I recommended earlier, a review of policies that govern workplace behavior. Um, if you have affinity groups or employee resource groups, engaging with those people who have chosen to volunteer their time and congregate based on their shared identity and lived experiences 
and facilitate some focus groups to ask them about their experiences. Um, if it's a small organization or if the leadership doesn't believe they can get authentic feedback, um, hire in an outside consultant or a third party to get the feedback because the goal, right, if people are willing to gift you with information about the gaps in their experience, then you also have a responsibility to act on that information. Um, and so cultivate uh, a safe space for people to provide that feedback is the moral of the story. Um, particularly, again, when we're talking about reviewing policies, um, look at the rates of internal promotion based on demographics. Um, see if there are any trends. If there's a particular group of individuals um, that tend not to be promoted at the same rate as the other um, demographic or population, then you want to, that, that gives you a cue on where you want to target in. So how can you do some focused development, some focus, not necessarily even saying that the people who aren't not being promoted at the same rate need more skill development, but rather the decision makers may need some training or some skill development to better assess um, in a more equitable fashion, who is worthy of promotion, who is worthy of sponsorship. Um, and so without doing that review, the assessment of your organization, um, you won't necessarily be able to identify those trends. So I'm suggesting that you look at them specifically. And this can be a part of your, your, your strategic plan towards equity. Um, and then identify uh, diverse ways to um, create pipelines for promotion and um, recruiting of diverse talent within an organization. So again, these are just some suggestions. Um, I'm sure you all could uh, supplement what I have to offer in this space. Build empathy. So one of the things that um, I like about empathy is that it can be used as a tool in order to further the goal of your strategy. Um, and, and that could include, but may not be limited to educating your population. Sometimes um, people are averse to change in narratives about the distribution or intentional distribution of resources because they believe um, that if you focus on one population that they're gonna miss out on something. And so it's really intentional about helping people understand the context of supremacy culture, the implications of colonialism, the structural way that policies um, have been designed to um, protect organizations that may inadvertently disenfranchise certain populations within an organization. Those arbitrary requirements for promotion, like you have to work here 10 years before you can be eligible to go up for X, Y, or Z. Um, so really painting the picture for people and building empathy will help get buy-in from some people in order to move that strategy along. And I want to emphasize the importance of moving forward, even if you don't have buy-in from everyone, because you don't need 100% consensus in order to move forward with these initiatives. Actually, you only need about 25% of any particular group in order to reach your tipping point to affect social change within any organization. All right, and then finally, my fifth tip, um, is sacrifice. That's sacrifice of time, energy, and resources um, because we didn't create these systems of inequity overnight. And so we won't, will not be able to remedy them overnight, which means if you're going to be committed to doing the work, it is going to take time. Um, it's going to require effort and it's going to take resources, human resources, financial resources, um, emotional investment you're going to um, have to make into this process. And so those are the five tips that I would like to eliminate for you in this conversation. Now, of all the things I said, um, here are the top five if you want to take a quick screenshot. So ways to promote equity in the workplace. One, assess your organization. Two, center the needs of the marginalized. Three, develop a strategy. Four, build empathy. And then five, make the commitment to make to, to, that, to that sacrifice, time, energy, and resources. And then quickly, I'm gonna summarize some of the benefits of equity. If you want to take a screenshot of this, increased innovation, employee engagement, employee retention, financial performance, so everyone reaches their goals and bottom line, um, and that comprehensively Im should improve the experiences for everyone. So it's a catch-all in that way. 
Now, one of the things I want to give you all the opportunity to do, um, because I said this work requires intentionality, is for you to brainstorm what would an equitable workplace environment look like, feel like, or sound like to you. Um, so I'll give you a couple minutes to reflect on that, and then I would like to hear from a couple people, and then we'll take some questions. I, Bianca, if you could elaborate on your question, I'm, I'm not getting the context of it. I, I apologize. You said how, how does inequitable workplaces look, feel, and sound like, or equitable? Equitable. Um, e equitable. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Be Yes. Earlier, I asked you all to reflect on policies or practices that sustain a culture of inequity. And so now I want you to vision and forecast what would an equitable environment look like? What would an equitable workplace environment feel like? And what would the conversation in the workplace be like if there were equity in that place? Thank you for asking that clarifying question. I'll give you all a couple minutes. All right, so I see some folks have uh, shared your perspectives in the chat. Would anyone like to come off mute and just share? Exercise your voice in this space. And I'm actually gonna stop sharing my screen so that we can see each other. Wanna share? Uh, diverse representation at all levels. Um, um, it would feel like being able to show up authentic and value, and it would and the conversation around would be professional, productive, fun, engaging, and safe. Thank you so much, Denisha. Gigi, I see you wrote in the chat. Are you willing to share your perspective? Audibly, would you like to come off mute? Yes, Dr. Carson. Hello. Carson. Okay, sorry. Uh, as for me, I would, um, plus the things I wrote, I also uh, support that there would be no exploitation, whether sexual, non sexual. Because when it's um, harmonious, it promotes the safety. Of the staff. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent point. I'm glad you voiced that in this space. Yeah, an environment that is free of harassment, discrimination, um, and sexual exploitation of any kind. Um, I'm not sure where you are physically located in the globe, so I'm not sure what types of laws or policies govern those experiences in the workplace, um, but that type of behavior is never acceptable in any context. Um, and any person who experiences it um, should absolutely have access to not only a safe environment, but hopefully a place to share those experiences in order to get support and find access to safety. Would anyone else like to come off mute and share your, your thoughts? What would an equitable environment look like, feel like, or sound like? Are you still speaking, Gigi? Yeah, I was. I was going to answer your, your uh, question. That I'm located in the MENA region, Middle East, nor North Africa. So um, it, a bit you might find it in the workplace that uh, um, there is no such kitable uh, workplace. So sometimes you might face those things. Mm. And and thank you. I I really like uh, women empowerment at uh, workplace in here. And I really support it all the time. It's very important for us to be to be feeling um, we're achieving our careers at the same time we are feeling safe and uh, protected. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for speaking out here, Tatiana. I see you raised your hand. Hola, good afternoon. Uh, I am from Costa Rica, so thank you for this space. In my case, uh, I feel like um, the perfect scenario would be where a woman don't need to, to be professional. 
you know, no limits, extra hours, extra time, answering emails at all times. And that's the kind of the kind of leadership that is celebrated. So uh, you feel like in this race, you know, that you need to do a lot to be able to be into consideration and be a leader. Thank you so much. Um, and you illuminated some, um, something that I intended, intended to speak about. So yes, the comprehensive consideration of what an employee needs, whether there's remote work, um, flexibility to care for a family member or a loved one, um, trusting employees to exercise their competencies in, in the way that will work best for them, and certainly not um, holding it against uh, women in particular, individuals who identify as women for having a family and prioritizing that and trying to balance a career and career aspirations. Um, any final comments before we close out for today's session? Here, I see your hand and then uh, Carla, we'll get you and we'll close out. We can't hear you. Really. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so in my experience, I would say the on the first question, what would it look like? It would look diverse, it would look global. That would include people with physical challenges, people with neurodiversities, uh, just diverse and globally diverse. So people from various cultures around the world. Um, I said for number two, to have a safe space. Uh, what would it look like? You can tell when a, when a space is safe because people feel space to uh, they, people feel safe to speak their mind, and that would go into number three, where folks would have the opportunity to have those difficult conversations. So people would have uh, shared experience conversations and talk about their cultures and where they come from. And I could, if you and I work together, you would know something about me beyond what you know about me at work because you're engaged in conversation with me or you have, if, if the person didn't feel safe, you know something about that person because you've tried to have that shared experience conversation and you, you have the opportunity then also to have those difficult conversations. So folks are having the difficult conversations at work and, and, and calling people out when, they are, when there is bias, that they feel safe enough to have that conversation to talk about bias. So that's, that's the type of environment I want to be in. So that's what I feel it should sound, look, and feel like. Thank you so much, Vera, for sharing that. Now, and before um, I lower your hand, please tell us where are you physically located in the world? I am in the United States in a state called Connecticut in the northeastern part of the United States. Fantastic. Thank you for logging in. And then our final comment for today, Carla, please tell us what's on your, your mind. Hi. Actually, it's more like a question, and it isn't an issue that I've always thought about it, and it's uh, on how, how do you deal with minorities or women that don't want any affirmative action, that they don't want to be like treated differently, because that's something I, I hear a lot in my workplace, and I say, no, I want to earn everything, I don't want any special treatment. And, and I think that's a big issue, right? So how, how can we deal with that? And and also, in, in, in how, how do you deal also, I think the other phase of that is, is privileged people that don't want to accept that many of their achievements are because of their, of their privilege and not because only merit, right? So I have like those two problems in my, in my workplace. <laughs> Sorry about that, about those two big questions at the end, but thank no you. No worries. Um, I will uh, begin with the last question. So. How do you engage people who hold privileged identities um, and, and help them understand the ways in which their privileges have um, given them access to opportunity? Is that, is that a good summary of your question? Yes. Okay. Well, um, one of the things that I will lean into is the recommendation that I offer for building empathy. Um, and so that, that requires creating opportunities for people to learn, to engage in dialogue, to share about um, their experiences, but also to engage in some thoughtful reflection 
on how they got to where they are, separate and apart from whatever credentials they hold. Um, that, and that means like asking people to reflect on their, their networks, you know, how many people in their networks hold similar identities to them, asking people to reflect on who their sponsors are, who the people are who've championed them to have opportunities. So the credentials and the years of experience, all those things being equal, who are the people that help support their growth and development in ways that are not necessarily tangible, but certainly have had an impact and influence over their, their career um, trajectory, access to resources and opportunities. Um, and, and really getting people to pause and reflect on like writing it down um, to make it plain for people. Because um, a lot of times people uh, are, are disinclined to accept the reality that they might hold privileges because come that often comes with a certain sentiment of guilt or conviction and privileges are simply things that people receive that they didn't earn and they didn't ask for um, and so it's not a matter of whether or not it's a question of people's character and a lot of times folks are concerned that they'll be labeled as a person of low character or a person who's done something wrong but the fundamental truth is as human beings we all have privileges. And so level setting that conversation to say, you might be more privileged in this way. By virtue of the fact that we are all here today, it's, it's reasonable to assume that we have some shared access to privileges that just give us access to this moment here in time. Um, and so level setting the dialogue gives people um, a different kind of access point because we all have egos. Um, and so one of the things I like to do is diffuse people's egos to the degree that I can um, and reduce defensiveness by talking about the things that we share and then moving on from that. And then when it comes to people who hold marginalized identities that don't wanna be treated differently, um, I, what I'm hearing is that the women within your organization, people who identify as women are saying like, I, I don't want to be given extra um, attention or resources be simply because I'm a woman. I want to be recognized for um, the value that I add to an organization. Um, and so I don't know that there's necessarily a need to differentiate, differentiate the efforts, but really just rebranding re them um, and shifting the conversation from you're getting this extra attention or you might be offered this supplemental resource because you're a woman. It's we value the ad that you bring to the organization and we recognize that you might um, need to be supported in a different way. So creating an opportunity for them to surface the gaps in their experience if there are gaps um, and then creating a space for them to co-create the solutions um, to those gaps, as opposed to saying, because you're a woman, this is what you get. Does that make sense? That's great. Thank you so much. Yeah, makes sense. And I believe we have run out of time. Julia, would you like to chime in here? Um, yes. To let me Thank you. Uh, and I'm sorry, it's pouring out here and the power goes in and out a lot. So hopefully I can stay with you guys until we're done. But um, thank you guys so much for being here today. And thank you, Theoria. That was wonderful. I don't know how you all feel, but I know I have a lot to reflect on. I think it's um, so important for us all to remember that in every organization and every set of circumstances around the world, no matter where we are, this is an important topic that we need to keep in focus in order to be able to make uh, significant change and move forward. So Theoria, I really appreciate you taking the time today to share with us. Um, this has been the second one of a part of webinar series that we're doing just on issues that we think are important for global leaders around the world. So uh, somebody from the UPS team will be following up to share Theoria's presentation and a video of this session as well in case you wanna reflect back on anything. Uh, but I just really appreciate everyone taking the time out of their day to be here and be a part of this. The community at UPS is, is amazing and something that we really treasure. And um, thank you guys for all being a part of it, especially you today. Well, thank you all for your engagement throughout the presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, and I'm, I welcome the opportunity to connect with any of you on LinkedIn. So feel free to, I see some folks have dropped their LinkedIn um, profile 
in the chat. And so our, if we can leave the meeting open long enough just to capture those um, for anyone who wants to share, that would be really great. Yes, feel free to, to put those in there and grab everybody's if you'd like. Thank you, thank you very much. You're welcome, thank you.